So without further ado, once again, we're going to say my introduction is to Mr. Yosef Lee. Uh, I met Mr. Lee. I let Yosef, we've been connected on LinkedIn for a little bit, but I really got to meet him and know a little bit more about him. Two weeks ago, we had uh, um, a meetup down in Manhattan, Midtown Manhattan, and um, it was really a good time, strong meetup. But I also want to, I met him also on Yosef, on Yosef, John Weiss's meetup <laughs> also, right? Get, yes. get me mixed up. And um, he had some great information. And I think that would resonate with a lot of people on this meetup. So Yosef, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lawrence, very much for having me here today. And it's great to see everyone here. And uh, as Lawrence uh, introduced myself, my name is Yosef, and I'm also called as Brosef. So that's kind of my nickname uh, amongst my colleagues, Yosef, my Brosef. And uh, let me share my screen so that I could kind of show you a little bit of my backgrounds and, uh, and discuss about my journey today. Um, I know this is real estate and it's okay uh, for you to become like newbie in a real estate session. I was once newbie and I'm still uh, on my toddler journey. I am following the giant's footsteps and uh, I just want to share my and a story as to how I started and then uh, what actions I'm taking at this my journey, right? So let me share my screen. Okay. And there you go. Where is it? Okay. okay, I'll start from here. Do you see a slide? I see multi-fan Rainmakers meetup. Oh, you see that one. Okay, hold on. Let yeah. me share. Because I'm trying to share uh, my background first. I'm just... Okay. That's the one I intended. Yes, yes. <laughs> Which was great, right? It, it was a great. Great meetup. All right. Let me, let me start with this one. Do you see a slide? Yes, I do. All right. Um, is it too small or too big or is it perfect size? It is just the right size. You can make it a little bigger. Okay, let me see what I can do. Go into presentation mode. Presentation mode. There you go. Where do I go? At the bottom, the one that right next to the minus sign. At the bottom, there's a minus sign. Oh, this. Yep. Who was that? Why wow, are you going to send me a check? Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> 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 All right. See, we, we learn every day, right? <laughs> no. All right. So here, this is uh, my picture from, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. <laughs> and my name is Yosef Lee. Uh, I'm still full-time attorney. I do civil litigation. And uh, I became a real estate investor, but close to a little less than three years ago. Um, I'm specialized in multifamily apartments when, I, when it comes to real estate. Um, so far in 2020, I closed my first deal that was 44 unit apartment in Kansas uh, in December 2020. And then in 2021, um, I did my first syndication, which is 68 unit uh, as, as a main sponsor group with my partners that I met through my mastermind and mentorship group. And thereafter, joining the forces, as you can see, we closed 64, 36, 72, 130 and 151 in September of 2021. And then 2022 in January 70, April 72, 76, June 115, 17 unit um, smaller property for heavy value add, heavy lifting in 96 in, uh, in August. And about two, two, three weeks ago, uh, 108 units, we just closed. And we have a couple more deals under contract. So basically this is, this is in a nutshell, my real estate journey. I, um, before starting a real estate, I was in, uh, as an attorney, my, my goal was to go up the corporate ladder, becoming a partner of a firm. But uh, soon, a couple of years ago, I started realizing that this is not the ideal lifestyle that I wanted to pursue by nature of my job. I got to put more time to make more money. And that vicious cycle was uh, something that I realized uh, a couple of years ago, my kids are growing up. They wanted more of my attention and they wanted to spend more time with me. And then I couldn't really accommodate that at one point. So that's when I 
just kind of struggled trying to reflect myself with whys and my callings and all that. And that's around when I uh, stumbled upon the book, Robert Kiyosaki, Reach That and Poor That. And that book completely changed my mindset upside down. Funny thing is I had a book for probably over 15 years, never read it. I don't know why it was on the shelf. It was given to me by my uncle. I told him, I remember, why don't you become a rich by reading that book? And then I was just sculpted at it. But maybe I was not ready back then, right? After, after experiencing um, something throughout my corporate life, you know, I realized this is probably not my thing. Um, reading that book, I started realizing about the power of being a, an investor and being a business owner as opposed to employee or simple employed. So that's when I started going to um, biggerpockets.com, started watching the YouTube videos and po- listening to the podcast when not. And that's where my journey started. It was throughout 2019. And uh, I started taking an action early 2020 when the pandemic happened. And uh, it shut down, but uh, it kind of came to me as a disguised blessing because I had a lot of time now to study the real estate for a couple of months. And I went all in. And then I was able to meet my partners. And, and even during the pandemic, I was able to close these deals together. Um, Mainly, there are a couple of groups that I work with together, and I work as an asset management, and I do legal due diligence as an attorney too, and I become the communication channel amongst all the attorneys. As you know, um, when we do syndication, we have lender's attorney, buyer's attorney, seller's attorney, SEC attorney. Now, I'm myself attorney with five attorneys, you know, think about the email chains of <laughs> communications, right? So I try to make that easy for my team to digest all their communications and I, I deliver that message to the attorneys when not. So I become the communication channels, uh, started learning capital raising and investor relations when not. And um, that's who I am now. Here I am. Uh, today, mainly, I want to talk about a my first deal called Chris and Heights Apartment. Hold up, hold up. Before you move off that slide, can you go back one slide? Sure. Tell me, do you really have your initials in your collar? Because that's swag, brother. Oh, that, yeah, that's kind of add on after a picture Photoshop. But uh, <laughs> I'm thinking about that. You have a good eyes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so Crescent Heights apartment. Uh, this is the actual picture that we took prior to acquisition of the building when we uh, when my uh, Boots Underground partner went there. So this is in Lawrence, Kansas. I'm in New York City. Like, how can you close an apartment in Lawrence, Kansas? Because I have a great partner who lives there in Kansas and he's my boots on the ground. So uh, look look at the parking lot and uh, there's a cracks here and there. That was literally that the first picture we took before um, getting this deal on the contract. All right. And this is kind of bird's eye overview, um, as you can see. Uh, it has like a four different buildings around this circular area and the parking lots. All right, I'm going to share some deal highlights. First, again, it's in Lawrence, Kansas, and it's a 1963 vintage. Uh, the total unit number is 44. So we have all uh, two baths and one bathroom apartment. There we go. All right, how do we how do we find this deal? Uh, my boots on the ground partner's friend who knew the seller uh, was able to um, connect us with the seller. The seller owned this for a while, like probably decades, and then he wanted to scale up. Um, and the my boots on the ground partner's friend, uh, you know, acted as if uh, as as a finder of the deal. So we later we ended up giving him the finder's fee. And uh, I believe it was about 1.5% or 2%. But in the beginning, seller wanted $2 million. And we had a striking price of $1.825 million. And then that was the deal made. Uh, he was true mom and pop owner. He had, um, you know, I, I noted here, when my boots on the ground partner went there to get all the due diligence document, he didn't have it scanned or PDF or anything. It was like a literally box of documents. And my boots on the ground partner has to, had, he had to literally scan everything in for us because me, I'm in New York and we have another partner who's from California. So he had to make it, he has to digitalize it and then send it out. It wasn't quite a work. 
okay, our LO letter of intent accepted in September 2020, and we got it on the contract in October. The seller really liked our team. I, um, later, maybe I could share. My tip here is when you reach out to broker or seller direct and try to have a one pager of who you are, and if you have a team members, what kind of team members you have and your goals. And, uh, you know, it's like a one pager document and introduction. It really helps to catch their eyes, right? You're not just calling them. You're not just emailing them. You're literally sending uh, about who you are. Okay. And he was a motivated seller. Like I said, he wanted to uh, scale that up. And the only condition that he had at giving us the deal was, only if you can close in 2020. So we said, all right, we'll make it happen. We have 60 days, we'll make it happen. Okay, all right. At the time of acquisition, the rent was approximately 150 to $200 lower than the surrounding apartment comes. So meaning we had an upside, right? We have a good upside to add value to it. So at that time, I said currently, but I was at the time, we had about average rent was $510. Yeah, it's like, I'm from New York. My first impression was like, no way. <laughs> How can it rent be $500? But it was, right? And uh, our underwriting uh, it showed uh, each year, we were able to increase at least $50 every year, like even to be conservative because the rent was so low at the time uh, against the uh, surrounding comes. And there was a new tenant who was already paying 620. So we, uh, that was like a proof of concept to us. Like, okay, like new tenants are already paying 620. Probably it will be easy to bump $100 in average, right? And then uh, we had exact same unit next door. When we say next door, it's another property. There has been a mirror image property next to uh, ours. Uh, we believe at the time of development, the developer probably created 88 units and he just cut in half and then just sold it to two different owners. So probably it's, so exactly the layout looks like it's, it's mirror imaged, but they were charging 775 in average. So we were confident that there's a huge upside, right? So we just raised 60 bucks for renew of the lease and we tried $200 bump for second floor. And uh, we just did the paintings and new carpets and $300 raise for the first floor after painting and just putting all the luxury and vinyl plank. And then we had, a, we had to change the, uh, the door to more uh, nicer ones. And then we're able to raise $300 for that. And at the time, it was over 90% economically and physically occupied. And we did 80% loan the cost from the local community bank. It was a recourse loan. And uh, if you have, as you go, if you have any questions, let me know. Like if you, I mean, I'm sure you probably know already so these terms, but if you do not know, we can explain later or you can kind of cut me off and, and, and then jump in and then ask me a question. Like we could do that, okay? So we did 80% loan to cost and uh, the terms were 4% interest rate, 20% amortization, 80, 80, uh, 18 months uh, interest only. And we had to put as a reserve upfront tax and insurance. And um, we separately uh, accounted in uh, interior and exterior rehab reserve for $250,000. And um, our projection from underwriting, uh, the year cash and cash return was a little above 30%. And uh, for 10 year holding and 10 year average, after 10 years, we accounted uh, cash out refi in about two, three years, then the cash and cash return would have jumped to about 40%. All right, so we did some inspections and inspection reveals some issues with the plumbings. It, it's an old, old vintage, right? Old apartment, the seller, like I said, motivated and uh, it was cash flowing. So he didn't really have to uh, fix a lot of things. He was not motivated to that. So we had to deal with this old, uh, vintage uh, issues, plumbing, mildew, termite, all there. And seller um, was nice to enough to, to take care of uh, all these issues before closing. And another thing was that the roof and HVAC system were kind of old too. So, uh, but it was too old. We told them, look, uh, we want you to fix this before closing or we got to retrade. And seller was already, 
you know, he was already out. Like mentally, he's already out. He already sold this. He was like, oh, you know what? We'll just give you credit. Okay. So what it, he was like, how much you want? And uh, my boots on the ground partner at that time, he said he didn't, he had no idea as to how much it would cost. So he just, he just out of his top of his head, just, just said um, hundred thousand and seller was okay with that. It's like, okay, we'll give you hundred thousand dollar credit. So we got that. And uh, so the actual uh, purchase price became 1.7 to, to 5 million. Right. And, and another story was that after about a year, we fixed all the roof and we changed HVAC. And I think total cost came out to be 70, I think five or 79,000. So we netted about $20,000 from that $100,000 credit. Okay. Uh, we had a property management company that we inherited. Uh, the seller had a property management company. They, uh, the company was close to the tenant. So we inherited them. So we started working with them together. And uh, yeah, so as a management, we had a goal of uh, managing the property managers. Uh, this is a little, uh, some term of, of the property management contract. We, had, we could terminate it within, with 30 day notice with the property management company. And uh, our goal was later, um, I mean, it's, it's a little different now, but our, my boots on the ground partner, he wanted to take over the property management side of the business later on. Uh, he's he, he's kind of put it on hold, but um, that was our initial plan. And at the time, we had a three vacant units, so we're uh, we were testing the market by turning it first floor and second floor. Uh, nothing heavy lifting. This is this is uh, like a C class area. Uh, the tenants are more of workforce people, so we didn't want anything like um, any any stream upgrade. This was okay as long as you make it nice. Right, so we did the painting and nothing heavy lifting, just floor, and uh, we were able to raise a list of fifty each year. And um, what did I write? Uh, yeah, sixty dollar above, no work done. Like they were okay with that because obviously they, when we raise the rent, they will do their own research and they will soon figure it out. Damn, this is this is at least hundred dollar lower than other properties. We we better just renew it, right? So we were confident in that. And we were able to do that. And at the time, I believe we had a month-to-month -month lease uh, of at least 50%. So we were more than half of month-to-month. -month, but uh, our goal was to convert that into yearly leases as we go. And in about 18 months, uh, so in the beginning, we had a goal of two, three years down the road to win a cash out refi. Um, but we kind of shortened that and then made it 18 months goal cash out refi into agency loan from uh, the community bank. And also, you know, just keep it for gener generational cash flow after that. That was our uh, main goal. And my function mainly was distribution. I, oh, sorry. So for the first six months, we did not take any money out. We just wanted to make sure we have nice cash flow. We just, Anything that that's from cash flow, we uh, rerouted that into reserve account to make sure we have we have we do we built enough cash reserve in case because it's an old vintage, right? And then uh, uh, after six months, uh, we set our cash and cash return as eight percent of initial money that that went in, and from that point on. We made a constant distribution at eight percent every, uh, like yearly eight percent cash and cash return in monthly every month, and at the year end of twenty twenty one, we had a distribution of bonus of ten percent uh, of uh, the money based on uh, the fact that we actually built six figure uh, reserve from the cash flow. So we were, um, you know, okay. Now we could we could distribute more, and the month to month. Level from 59, it went to below 5% month to month in about 18 months. And a CapEx, uh, about $220,000 was spent on you know roof and HVAC and the parking lot and all that. And average rent, we were able to push it from 510 to average 650, about $140 uh, per unit. And some to some people, it does not, it may not mean much. Unless they under, unless they know how this can uh, do a magic when it comes to a multifamily over five units commercial side, we had a, a couple of delinquent tenants. 
with the government voucher and two, three tenants was evicted throughout 18 months period. Another amazing thing was that this state, Kansas, is, it only takes two months to evict. I'm not trying to laugh at, or I'm not trying to, uh, you know, be, be cruel on evicting a tenant. I mean, they were like damaging the units and they were not paying for a while. So, I mean, uh, we got to do what we got to do. It was, and, and they were causing troubles for other tenants there. Um, but it, this is unheard of in New York, right? Right, Lawrence? You, two months, you evict? Two months, uh, trust, trust, trust six months to a year. Yes, yes. <laughs> And now I'm going to give a little bit of explanation of what I mean by magic, right? So um, there's a concept called, we, we all know what appreciation means, right? The market goes you know, up and then our property value goes up. But there is something called forced appreciation in multifamily. What it is, is not the market, but as an owner, you have a control over appreciation. How? If the multifamily goes over five units, it's like it, it is considered to be commercial real estate. And the value of the property uh, gets decided based on the income, how much income the property generates. Meaning, if we push our rent and reposition wisely so that we reduce the expenses, our net operating income goes up. That means our value of the property goes up. So in and of itself, that's what I mean by the owner has control over the appreciation, not the market. I mean, there's a natural appreciation portion, obviously, because cap rates are going now over the long term. But there's not there's a control portion of it. That's what I like about multifamily because I can control at least a portion of it. So now let's go back to $140 per unit. Uh, average rent raise now times 44 right because it's 44 unit and times 12 to calculate yearly amount and we raised and this is called net operating income because i'm not i'm not um i'm not accounting the expenses that was reduced i'm just accounting only the rent that went up now the net operating income approximately seventy three thousand dollars was raised okay it's a it's a great money but yeah, what is it gonna do Right now, what we do is uh, the commercial property. Uh, you can uh, get the value by having uh, that operating income dividing that operating income by a cap rate in that area. That will that is the value of the property. That's in general how you value the property. Now, this area at the time of purchase, we consider that to be like eight percent cap area. So if you apply 8% cap, this $140 rent raise in average for this entire property, actually in value-wise after calculation, it pushes up 900, over $900,000 value to the property. If it becomes 7% cap, it's over a million dollar value add to this property in a year and a half and forced, right? We were able to force it. So now we started shopping around for cash out refi. So our goal was to jump from community bank to agency loan. Uh, the process started in February of this year, right? So we closed this in December, 2020. And then February of uh, this year, we started the process of cash out refi. So that's like in about one year and about three months, right? And then we were able to get a deal with CBRE and with Fred, uh, Freddie Mac, and uh, we locked in the rate, luckily, before the interest high. <laughs> so we're so lucky. Um, and the lender appraisal came out to be, and they applied 5.75 cap rate. So the lender appraisal came to us as a $3.4 million. It's even more than we expected. So the value almost doubled within like a year and a half and uh, it's not natural appreciation, just like one or two single family duplex property. It's a forced appreciation, meaning we worked to force this appreciation. So with Freddie Mac, we had a 75% loan to value, 12 month of IO, and 3.97% of interest rate, which was lower than the original loan. So uh, we took out 75% loan to value for $3.4 million. And that proceeds after paying out the old debt was a little over than original capital. So what, what just happened? We took out our 100% uh, 
money that went in out through this cash out refi and it still cash flows. This is the concept of infinite return now because we don't have anything in it, right? Few things I learned from this deal. Education, I didn't know a thing before uh, I, I started this journey. Like not only I did self-education through all the videos, materials and YouTube videos and free stuff, but also I joined a, a mentorship group and mastermind to also learn step-by-step -step education to also have a right team, right? So education is critical, but to get the right education, you need to be guided by people who are more experienced than you are because just by self-educating, you will, it's just like we're having a teacher. Why do we go to college? Although yes, it's sometimes it's a waste of money, but the basic idea is we wanna be guided. We don't just want to study our, uh, of, of our own. We want to be guided by more experienced people, right? It could be from biggerpockets.com or mentorship program. And also, uh, we, we join the teams. Why? Because we want the partnership. If you're dealing with single duplex, yes, you can do it yourself. You could be wearing all the hats yourself and then do it yourself, which is great. I'm not, and, and, and doing a single family duplex in and of yourself, people make a lot of money and, and it's lucrative business, I know. So I'm not trying to uh, look down on smaller units or anything. This is just simply different play. I chose to be in uh, uh, the commercial side of real, multifamily real estate. And because that, I couldn't do it alone. I had to find a team. So right partnership is very important. You need to surround yourself with highly motivated, like-minded people. Just like what Lauren said in the beginning, your net worth is your, your network is your net worth. I am literally feeling it throughout the last two, three years, right? Make sure you work with those who interest are, whose interests are aligned with yours because now you're in the team. For example, if your goal is to hold a property for long-term for, for more of generational wealth type thing, but if your partner wants to sell it in two, three years and do like a multiple flips, then you're not going to be, your interests are not aligned together. You're not going to be able to work with them. Right, so, so make sure to engage yourself with the, with the people who have um, same interest in the, and same investment philosophy. And also same work ethic uh, is very important. And so you got to do a lot of networking. And those you who, you who came to this meetup with Lawrence and follow Lawrence, you're doing the right thing to do, right? And next thing is massive action taking. Uh, this is very important. I can't emphasize now. When I was doing self-education, I thought I was taking actions because I was reading, I was writing, I was studying, but it is really not an action. action. It's, uh, it's passive. It's, you're taking action, but it's more of passive action that you're just observing the information. I think from my, my belief and my perspective, true action comes from making an execution on a plan and then literally moving things forward. Unless you're executing on a plan, you're not taking an action. And uh, meet a lot of people on the right deals, right? And these are actions. Literally, not, not just studying how to talk to the broker, not just studying how to underwrite, literally underwriting a deal, literally calling the broker and, and literally talking to them. This is the action, right? And practice your pitch. Like based on all this practice, you'll be better and better only. And fall in love with the process. It's a long process. Now, each year for the last two years, I am in like more than like seven deals. And people say, how could you? But I tell them, well, uh, you'd be surprised if I tell you my first deal happened about 10 months Later, I joined a great, amazing mentorship group, even joining that mentorship group, even at the same time, joining another amazing mastermind. Deal didn't come to me at once. Like I had to put a lot of work into underwriting deals, finding partners and practicing my pitch and, and, and looking for the markets. After all this accumulation and mass of time and, and, and these efforts and meeting the right team, it, it just happened in the end. So falling in love with the process. This is one thing I heard in the beginning of my journey, but 
now I, it, it just comes to me even more uh, as a deeper, deeper uh, meaning because now I know what it means to fall in love with the process, not the result, right? And so you got to enjoy it and be persistent and be patient. And you will definitely see the result in the multifamily if you're trying to take that journey. And this is my team. I always have this picture because I love them so much. Uh, Joe is the Boots on the Ground partner. Uh, on the top right corner, it's me. Handra to the left side is from California. In the middle, Mercy, she does mainly um, uh, asset management with me. Um, Handra and Mercy are from California, the couple. And Marco is uh, my mentor, a partner, and, and, and becoming a good friend of mine now. Um, we are as a team. Uh, this was the, the first shot after we closed that 44 unit deal together. Actually, I did Photoshop the Mercy. Uh, <laughs> she wasn't there, <laughs> but she deserved to be in the middle. Uh, yes, that's uh, my uh, journey. I'm going to stop. Oh, I want to show you uh, this picture uh, that I took at the meetup. This is the meetup that Larry came, right? Lawrence, you see the picture? No, I don't see the picture there. Hold on, this is not, let me share. Uh, yeah, this one. Do you see a picture? No? No. Hmm, how come? How about now? Yeah, I see it now. All right, so this was the meetup that I had uh, on September 17th. So it's only been two weeks, but I'm still, I, I feel like I'm still there. Uh, great picture. I think Lawrence. I'm waiting back. I'm waiting back. You're waiting back. Okay. Back, so, uh, yeah. yeah, we had, we had about 80, I think 80, 90 people. Um, uh, we had a great time, great foods, great networking. Uh, I did this. Uh, I, I started virtual meetup with a co-host back in 2020, uh, June. And every month I co-host a virtual meetup, but after the pandemic situation got a little easier, um, me and my co-host, we decided to throw our in-person, which happened in July 1st one, which was also successful. It was full of people. I, I had to put people in the, on the waiting list because a lot more people wanted to come and the, limited, uh, the space was limited. So I got the bigger space this time and more people came and uh, it was just a lot of fun. So if you're in New York, um, if you want to be uh, an attendant on this meetup for the future ones, let Lawrence know so that you can come together and uh, you know we can in person hang out. If not, we can always meet in virtual meetup and things like that. And uh, we could uh, hang out that way. Um, I am really try to be active on social media and very easily approachable. And all my social media handles are same LinkedIn, Facebook, Insta, TikTok. It's all Yosef, your brosef. So it's Y O S E F. Y O U R B R O S C F, and uh, you can reach out to me, and we could we could get on a Zoom call, just share my experience. If you have any questions, I'm an open book. Lawrence can tell I'm an open book. I, I don't hide anything. I share even numbers. So um, yeah, that's uh, that's who I am. And thank you very much for listening to my story. Thank you, man. That's awesome, man. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Awesome, man. You know what? I want to ask you a quick question before I open the floor. Quick question. You mentioned something about credit, right? Credit. I'm sorry. What was that? You mentioned something about the buyer gave you credit. The seller gave, yes. The oh, seller the gave us credit. Gave credit. Right. Yes. For those who are, how, how did the seller give you credit? How did you say it was $100,000? So did he give you $100,000 of the, of the price? What did he do? Oh, so when I said credit, um, at, on the day of closing, the seller and buyer will receive uh, something called closing statement. And on the closing statement, you will see uh, how much of purchase price and how much of money is coming from the lender, how much money coming from the buyer. And then the lender uh, had spent some money like appraisers and their origination fees and all that. So the charges, so you will see debited amount and credit amount in each column. And uh, the, the title company will also put their, their amount on the debit column saying, uh, this is charged for the title policy. This is charged for recording fees and all that. So you will see that. And what I mean by credit, the seller, uh, well, in the beginning on the contract, we put $1.8 million to, uh, $1 to $5 million as a purchase price. 
but by giving us $100,000 credit on the closing statement, you will see $100,000 being given to us as a credit. So the actual price itself on closing will still be seen, it will still show as $1.825 million, but the actual behind the scene price that we pay to the seller is 1.725. Okay, okay, okay. So I, I, want, I want to say I appreciate you in the beginning telling people to, tell, telling people if you're new, bear with me, right? And I'll explain to you because I have to tell you by this. Sometimes you take open up fire hose of the people and you boil them over, knock them down. They're interested no more. So thank you for first of all keeping it simple, right? So I'm open the floor. Any questions? Anybody have some questions? Go ahead, Andrew. Yourself would be fucking broke. Would you brokey? <laughs> You haven't fucking got one. Where's your compound? When SEAL Team 6 come for you, you're going to fucking die. See you later, Andrew. Okay, so moving right along. He's going. Ah, I, wish I, <laughs> I, wish, I wish I had so much time in my hands. You know what I'm saying? I wish I had so much time in my hands. Any other uh, questions? Yeah, anybody, if, if you have questions, even, even there's no such thing as a dumb question because I've been through that. Right. I was literally have asked dumbest question ever and still got great answer so <laughs> i try my i'll try to do the same thing so J -A, just j a uh j bland please you, you tell me you're new ask a question right ask a question if you're not yes, sure sir. uh uh yes I, can you hear me i hear yes. you hey, hey, jay oh, okay cool um no i i again yes i'm very new to the process um and again i my apologies for my my tardiness but um I, i'm not sure if you if you covered your your first deal mm -hmm. um or not but I, I guess what's um say for example for me it, it, you know i'm not sure what i'd like to invest in or how maybe i guess how much so what would you recommend a newbie like myself how, how would you what would you recommend to me mm -hmm. uh, to get started or, you know, just to get my feet wet into the real estate investing business? Sure. Uh, my recommendation is, is first sit down and then put a pen and paper and start writing down what your goals are, right? Depends on what your goals are. Your game will be different. Uh, meaning if you're, good with tenants if you enjoy directly interacting with tenants and your handyman fixing the stuff being able to do all that and then then it's great that you have a potential of being very successful on doing an either flip single family duplex house hacking and things like that you could you could go smaller and directly deal with the property and and repairs and, and tenants that's a, your option person like myself who has no skill set at all whatsoever, and uh, and I'm not enjoying at all uh, interacting with tenants directly. I mean, I could, but um, I would rather choose not to. That's uh, one of the reasons why I chose bigger multifamily because going to multi bigger multifamily is more of becoming a landlord. It's more of owning a business system that comes with a full time real estate uh, property management company. And you got to now deal with the lease agent. You're literally, and you got to come up with a business plan of uh, of ma managing the entire complex, not only just the house in and of itself, parking lot, you know, all the roofs and and even even like trees and everything. So this is more of a bigger scale uh, managing the asset. That's why we call ourselves asset manager as opposed to property manager, because now we manage the property manager. But it's not that easy as it sounds because you got to know your game to manage the property managers. If you don't know what you're doing, you're not going to be able to tell what your property management company is doing for your property, right? So if you want, you can, you can start from single duplex and then slowly come to a multifamily later on. That's one way. Do I think going to small uh, is prerequisite of before going to multifamily? I don't think so because I didn't do it. I straight went into multifamily, but then you got to be determined to be patient because if you do single family flipping or duplex, 
you could do like multiple of them in a month all day if you are determined. But with the big multifamily, it took me 10 months, 10 months to the first deal. So if you're okay with being patient, going all in, doing all the work, uh, forming the team, then go for it. So that's why I said, what, what do you enjoy? What are your goals? Is your goal more of transactional or cash flow? Meaning if you're going after wholesaling, flipping, the real estate activity in and of itself is active and transactional. The reason why I go multifamily more for cash flow, because I don't want it to be transactional. I want to keep it and, and con- I want to make the constant cash flow and stack them up over and over for the next five years and 10 years without selling them. So there's no transaction here. And you can do that with smaller multifamilies, but I see uh, many of my colleagues, they, they owned five, 10, 20, even some like 100 single families. At one point, they always come to big multifamily because now they realize, okay, it's easier to manage 10 units under one roof than to manage 10 properties in all different areas, 10 different Ds, 10 different property management companies. And I mean, in theory, I'm saying, right? So you, you got to choose what kind of, you could even be a flipper. Like I, I know somebody who just enjoys uh, flipping like quick, quick for a quick box. And then they will invest their money into uh, passive investing. It's apartment syndication. Passive investing is more like stock, dividend stock where you're not really driving the deal, but you're just becoming a money investor and just wait for the return. You might not feel like you're doing a real estate, but some people prefer that because they uh, love what they do as their job, like maybe W2, high, high income owners. They just, they have no reason to go to active real estate investing side, dealing with the tenants and fixing toilets and all that. They just want their money to make money. So there are many different ways to become a real estate investor. You just need to know uh, what you want and how to get there. Hopefully this uh, this kind of makes sense. I threw a lot, but. uh... So I did. (laughs) So J.A. wants to ask a question. J.A. says, how much personal money, how much personal money did you have to put down Mm -hmm. for the 44 units? The, The for that. So we had a six partners, everybody chipped in and we had a 600, I think $600,000 altogether as a down payment. And we had a lender fill up the rest. Now the question is how many partners did you have? Six. Six partners. Okay, yes. So therefore, how much down payment you needed? 600. Okay. So therefore there's a hundred thousand a piece. Okay. Yeah. Some people put 75, some people put, right. you know, like, right. but all of us together, six people put um, about 600,000, okay. if not 520, not top of my head, but it's, it's over, a little over 500,000. So in, mm-hmm. in between that, yeah. Okay, no problem. Uh, J.A., you have any other questions, J.A.? Jay Blaine, you have any other questions? Because I believe new people, new people who are just learning to understand. They uh-huh. need to- <laughs> Again, like 40 units, 30 units, 50 units might sound a little scary in the beginning. Uh, if, if you're just starting, it, it, was, it was to me when I just started. My initial goal was even, even after deciding to go to multifamily and big multifamily, my goal was 12 units to 16 units at the time. And I never bothered to look more than like 30 units. But uh, what happened was uh, the 44 unit. But uh, yeah, so, but if you do it, Soon real, I soon realized it, you just spend about the same amount of time and same amount, amount of energy to close 43 unit and uh, smaller properties like duplex. Is so you that- might as well just, uh, you know, go bigger to, to try. And again, I mean, it's, it's not as easy as it sounds, but uh, it's doable. And I'm the proof constant, right? It's doable. Are, uh, were you invested in small multifamily because of where you live? Like, you know, a 44 unit in... New York is going to cost you probably 25 million, whereas you know a, a 44 unit in Kansas is going to cost you 2.5 million. Is, is that the reason why you were looking at you know small multifamily? Uh, 
well, I'm, I'm sorry. Question was, I was reason, reason why the reason why you were looking at small multifamily because you were based out of New York. Oh, okay. No, I was I was thinking too small. Okay. That that's why. Yeah, I, that was scary. A forty unit was is scary. Over thirty it was like wow, very scary. I, to me, over ten unit was big enough uh, to to try and go pursue. Looking back, I was thinking too small, and uh, I tried in the beginning uh, New York, a little further New Jersey, a little further Connecticut, looking for cash flow. But I soon realized, like, this is a little different. This is more appreciation market where they make money when property prices goes up like crazy high. And then you sell it, you make chunk of money, and then you got to do it again. I, I didn't like that because it's so transactional here. Unless, like, the, the big multifamily are for institutional money plays. So unless you're institutional, your play in New York will be more of small duplex or triplex or quads. And, uh, and again, it will, it will, Unless you you are um, really set up for uh, like long term hold, you, it will always be like more transactional selling when it's more expensive and it's it's the game here because appreciation is like crazy in New York. Mm -hmm. But the the markets I looked at outside Southeast where like Midwest, their appreciation is not as crazy as New York. However, their price is low compared to New York. So and then they have a very good rent collection there. Landlord, landlord friendly, and uh, so all these metrics worked for uh, for me to pick the market outside of this tri-state area. So, um, Brenda has a question. Um, how do you know what's? He has a, it's a three part question, two part question. First of all, how do you know what's a good area to invest in? Uh -huh. The second question is, what resources do you use to determine that? Okay. For example, uh, crime, surrounding entertainment, schools, etc. Mm -hmm. So basically, you kind of mentioned. So what we did in the beginning, and what what I was told to do from my mentors and uh, colleagues was, you got to be able to pull the data out, right? So you you uh, you apply population growth for the last 10, 15 years, um, job growth, uh, income growth, household income growth, and median income growth and crime rate that goes down, you will pull all the data and you will put it on the spreadsheet. And I did this exercise and you will come up with a certain states. Mm -hmm. And coincidentally, these are the states in, uh, in the red states uh, because we, first of all, you know, the East Coast, West Coast, we excluded it. Blue state excluded it because they're more tend to be tenant friendly than versus landlord friendly. So we apply that, all these metrics, it comes out to be somewhere Midwest or Southeast, right? So if you pick any state out of those, <laughs> you, you will hit the, the good market. But the trick is real estate is really a pocket specific. So even in that overall, the metrics work, but even if you go deeper in, Pocket is different because the matrix will pulled based on that entire gen general vicinity, not its pocket. So you got to do second layer of that by literally going into like a deep level and lot level, county level, which uh, the tools I use is, um, I, I could probably show you if, uh, if you're willing to. Do we have more time? Can I? Can yeah, I? Yeah, sure. We got time, man. Listen, this is, this is about education. Yeah, hold bring on. So, bring your value to people. That's what, that's what I'm here for. All right, give me one second. Um, I have it's called Nomad. Let me see if I can share. Really? That. Sorry. All right. So, there are a couple of free websites I use uh, to pick market specific you know, data. Um, you go. Let me share my screen. Do you see my mm -hmm. Google? Okay. Let me see my bookmarks. All right, here you go. Um, so for example, Data USA is one, mm -hmm. one website I use. And FEMA flood map. So when I 
this is another website I like to use, but picking the market uh, in and of itself, I use Nomad. Hold on. Sorry, let me let me mute. Sorry, I had a whole call. Come on. Okay. You said no, you said no mud. No mud. Uh oh, no mud. Yes. How do you spell that? N-O-M-A-D. Uh, it's it's actually uh, made by one of the colleagues I met through a mastermind, and he started selling the subscription when I was one of the early early subscription ones. Market Nomad, you know. Fine. Okay. So let's see if mine still works. Oh, there you go. Mine still works. <laughs> <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't gone into this for a while. Oh, he had a lot of updates. Okay. So what it does is it shows in a, in a like territory level, you go in, state level, county level, metro statistic area level, city and trek. So for example, let me see what address. I'll just put random address of what? All right, this is one of the addresses, one of the properties address that we uh, we own like together. So uh, if you put in this address and on a state level, oh, oh you know what? My probably my subscription has been done. Maybe that's why. Sorry, but what it does is like you can you can actually go when track in at the mm -hmm. plot wise. It shows for the last ten uh ten twenty years census data as to population growth. If growth population is going down or going up, mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. So sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I think I lost the subscription. Um, and then it will show for the last, so the data is, is all from census. He pulls out mm -hmm. and it shows a uh, house median household income. So when you find a property, what I do is, so after picking some markets for a pocket specific, you got to do it based on the specific property that you get from the broker. You punch in and that general area of track of land will show what's the median household income, what's the population growth. If even if the overall state or county in and of itself population is going up, if your specific property, the area where you, your specific property is situated, the population is going down. You don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's something that I look at. And not only that median household income, for example, the property that you want to purchase, your underwriting has um, monthly average rent of, of let's say $700. Then you don't want to go in an area where the median household income is below 20,000, for example, right? Or you got to have a uh, certain uh, enough income. You got to see enough median income to find at least decent tenants in that area. So these are the numbers that I look at. For example, also data USA. So this is data USA. So I specifically put in the data USA, Knoxville, Tennessee, because that's one of the markets I was looking at. It will show 2020 population, 180, you know, thousand. And, um, you know, median, median uh, household income is 41,000. So I like to go into where the median household income is at least above 35 and between 60,000. And that's where the tenant basis I used to look at, at like a C-class, higher value add, um, C-class tenants, um, more of like a blue collar uh, people who will continuously rent as opposed to if you make too much incomes, they're likely to buy, right? As opposed to rent. So these are the things I used to look at and data USA, uh, as one, uh, U.S. Census is another. 
uh also what else uh, do you, do you use, do you use um, Lexus Nexus also? Uh, I've seen people using it. I personally, I did not use it, but this is another website I use, FEMA Flood Map Service. First thing I do when I get the property address, I punch in and see if there's any, uh, if the prop property is situated is within within flood zone area or not. If it is within the flood zone, I pass because the insurance premium is just uh, is is just tripled right good idea i have a property in the flood zone yeah uh, yes yes Wish i mean <laughs> right just because it's in, in the flood zone doesn't mean that it will be but it's highly likely over the time yeah and and uh it's it, it will be a problem when you try to sell it if you decide to sell later because someone else will do this <laughs> for your property Mm -hmm. right and yeah these are these are the ones maybe uh maybe i could share another one um like uh yeah going into the county um yeah so it's it's a lot of uh market research through these websites and lastly another uh tool that i use um is my underwriting tool called synthesis and uh it's it's a big spreadsheet that uh you get all these numbers and you get all the profit and expenses from the seller, the specific numbers from the deal, and you punch into the spreadsheet and then you calculate whether this deal is good deal or not based on the return that you see from the calculator. So um, yeah, it's, it's one of the I have downloaded into a computer, so I'm just trying to see the website here. Um, maximum deal analyzer. No, this is not. This is my Jake and G now. Okay, it's not here, but it's called synthesis. That's the the calculator that I use the most. So there's a separate spreadsheet where we use to punch all the numbers in, dead dead uh, terms and amounts, and how many investors are coming in. What what is our purchase price what is our raise what is that ratio what what is the uh the projection of rent growth and cash refi average rent we pull log in all these numbers that will it will speed out okay this is um you know 10 percent cash and cash return for yearly this is seven percent this is 13 percent irr and things like that thank you Seth. thank you very much and what what was the next question? I, I think uh that was probably there, there, there was a whole there, yeah, yeah. Is that oh, okay? There, there, was a, there was a whole question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah what what are supposed to do is for yeah, for crime and things, right? That that was it. That was it. Thank you, Yusuf. Thank you very much. You no, it. my pleasure, my pleasure. No, I'm, I'm, I'm any other questions? Okay. Question. Uh, I, I was going to ask. You've done a, a, a quite a few deals now in the last few years, it sounds mm -hmm. like, and I, I, it sounds like you're more on the asset management side, but um, when it comes to capital raising, usually everybody's involved. So mm -hmm. has there ever been a time when that's been an issue and either being able to raise enough before close or after close and how, if so, how did you guys manage that situation or if that makes sense yeah, yeah yeah that makes sense um i was lucky enough to not have been able to experience short shortfall of capital uh, because we have in our team we have amazing capital raiser and um so i didn't have any pressure to raise but you know uh as my friends and family people see what i do they are interested they wanted to you know, see the deals and then they the couple of my friends invested with me together um in the beginning the funny thing in the beginning i wanted to raise capital so i i actually started talking about deals and all that in the beginning but it didn't really work because when it comes to uh, real estate all they think about is small ones so to them like being an apartment uh investor uh or 
like 20, 30 people gathered together, buying a big multifamily together. It, it's kind of boring to them. And they, uh, they were kind of skeptical on that too. So a couple months I tried, you know what? I give up, you know, I'm not going to try to convince you or anything. Uh, you know, just watch me what I do. And then, and then, you know, I just did what I do. And then uh, after closing the first deal, people started asking me like, what, what is this? Right. And uh, so it takes time to raise capital. And, and uh, when you try not to raise, when you try to just simply educate people, the benefit of investing into a deal, I think they naturally, they get interested in more. And then that's when you can talk about the deals more instead of just trying to like be more salesy, I think. So again, back to your question, I did not experience, ex had experienced any shortfall of capital, but I've seen some people uh, going through that. And, and then uh, we had, um, as, as a, within the mastermind group, we together kind of jumped in and try to, you know, think about if we could bring in more capital raisers to to uh, make up that shortfall and 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 like in like a week, like we try to find somebody who's more liquid. So we had a colleague who was short on like two million dollars, but in the mastermind we had a, we had somebody who was sitting on cash like seventeen a <laughs> seven million dollar cash. So he actually did like um one and year and a half or two year like hard money lending to them with uh, high interest rates. So they were able to use that as a secondary loan but on top of their to the question is if, if, if you are running short on your raise, you mm -hmm. can find a high net worth individual who will come in. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that high net worth individual, when they're coming in, they're probably going to want special terms. So if you have created a PPM, Mm -hmm. Right, you're going to have to do an adjustment to your PPM so that you can bring them in in order to complete the deal, but you run the risk of losing other investors who weren't privy to that same deal. Mm -hmm. So, whenever you have a PPM and people have signed it, if you change it, mm -hmm. you have to reissue a, an amendment to the PPM in order to ask people that they still want to stay in the deal, mm -hmm. and if they see that someone else has better terms than they have they can sometimes want to pull out their equity and go to another deal. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of ways that you can do it if you're running short on raising your capital. But I would say before you go hard on, on your deal, you want to make sure that you can raise the capital. Otherwise, you lose your, your, your EMD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, thank you for the answer. Um, Alex, as, as Lee said, we don't raise as uh, as we get a deal, we raise before we getting a deal, right? We, we educate people. Mm -hmm. We tell them this is the type of deal that we deal with as a team. I, I think that's when the track record comes into handy, right? And then you continuously uh, educate them. And, you know, I, I believe in that people invest not in a deal, not only in the deal, but also in the team. So you, it's really important to, as a team, to get to, uh, know the, the the investors and for the investor to get to know the team and, and kind of, you know, that creates that community. That's how, what we're trying to strive to be. Thank you very much for that. Because I'm going to say, so this is, I'm going to say this at the end. People don't invest in the deal, they invest the people. They do, definitely. Right. People have definitely. to read the PPM, right? Mm -hmm. People invest in my deals, right? But they have they have to sign a subscriber agreement and that subscriber agreement says that they have read the entire PPM front to back. And they're saying that they understand everything that's inside of that document. So just because they're invested in me, they still have to read the oh. PPM, sign it, sign the subscriber agreement before they wire money's over. So it, it, it's a, it's a totally different game when you're playing in a million dollar space. Mm -hmm. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. But when I, when I say that, though, when I say that people invest in a deal, people invest in you because they know, like, and trust you. And that brings me to the point of the KLT, for those who are new, KLT, know, like, and trust. That's why it's important to network with people. The people don't know you, they can't like you, they don't like you, they can't trust you, they can't trust you, they're not going to invest with you. 
Right. So if you want to put your information in the chat at all times, get educated, like um Yosef said. And if you're in, in the if you're past investing, read the PBM, right? That's for what. sure, for sure, hundred percent. And, right, so, and yes, even if, if you're here, you know, you're gonna have to sign and say you read the PPM. Yeah. If you don't read it, you don't read it. If but you you're gonna have to you sign and say you mm -hmm. read it. Even if you don't, even you got that's what that's called. You got to do your due diligence. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Due diligence in everything you do, even in relationships, you gotta have due diligence, right? You don't get to a relationship, and at the end of when you get married, oh, by the way, I didn't tell you this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. All that's right. A, that's a surefire way to get divorced. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, yes. Yosef, I want to say thank you again for coming on tonight. I appreciate your time. I know you got little ones at home, um, and school is tomorrow, is it? I don't yeah, know. they start okay. school tomorrow. I, I, I'm, I, I've been out of the school game for a while. Right. But um, I want to say thank you for coming on again, Yosef. I appreciate you.